Good afternoon. You've all had an all long had a long hard day. How long have we got, Michael? Half an hour? Yes. Okay, and what do we want to do QA as well? Okay, so we'll try and scoot through um, the stuff I've got that's prepared. And um, this is uh, WPP. Uh, actually, it was last year's WPP. So um, it was, uh, our theme was from Mexico. This year, the theme is from Africa. Some of you may have seen the annual report that just came out a few days ago. Um, we deliberately show it this way because um, there are diseconomies of scale in our business. The only area where we get economies of scale really is in media buying. I'll come, I'll come on to that in a second. But basically, people think the bigger you get, the worse you get. That's the perception. So clients think the bigger you get, the worse you get, which I disagree with, but it's the perception. And the people inside the agencies think the bigger they get, or the bigger we get, the worse it gets. And I'm sure some people in the room are wrestling with those issues. So we, we deliberately show it as messy. Uh, is actually, there are 16 verticals here, no more. It looks as though there are, uh, people often say we have 150 companies or God knows what. But effectively, we have 16 verticals. And uh, just, just so you're clear as to what WPP is, the first figure is probably the most important, which is the billings figure, which is 76 billion. And the reason that's important is that's really where we get the leverage on behalf of our clients. It's interesting that no other agency group actually gives you a billing number. We've been, we've been um, and I know there are a lot of agency groups in the room, or they're supposed to be. Um, the, the interesting thing is that nobody, nobody co comes out with it, which raises the question about why is it that they don't come out with it, but we, we can talk about that maybe in the Q&A. Our revenues, excluding associates. Associates are companies that we own nine, uh, 20 to 49 percent of. So if you include those, it's uh, 23 billion. And if you include investments, that's companies we own under 20 percent of, it's 27 billion. That's a bit of a cheat, the 23 and the 27, because I'm consolidating 100%, but it's nice because it makes you look bigger than you actually are, which when you're somebody like me who's vertically challenged, you like to do. The EBITDA is uh, just over $3 billion. PVT is 2.5 billion. We have 123,000 people in 111 countries, 179,000 including associates, 188 including investments, and the market cap is about 32 billion actually now, 32.5 billion. Just in orders of um, comparison, the next biggest is Omnicom at 19. Publicis is about the same at 19. You remember they tried to get together. Um, they're actually, actually similarly sized now, which is sort of remarkable when you think how much bigger Omnicom is in comparison to Publicis. Um, and then you go on down to Denso, I think is around 12, if I remember rightly. IPG around 10, and Havas around, I'm thinking about four. But anyway, those are rough orders of magnitude. Now, the reason that's important is when people think about who our competition is, you know, if Google is our competition, which some people believe either directly or, in, you know, we describe them as a frenemy. They're, I think they're sponsoring this conference in part. If Google is a, comp is a competitor, it's at 360 billion. So we are, we are tiny in comparison tiny in terms of market cap. We can come on and talk a little bit more about that in a second. Now, our strategy, which is important, if you're looking at the future, it's the strategy that counts. And our strategy is very simple. It might be wrong, but it's very simple. It's new markets, new media, data investment management, which is a fancy phrase for consumer insights or market research and the application of technology, and what we call horizontality, which is getting our people to play together. Clients no longer want the vertical brands. They no longer want, we, we, we think they want this. The people who run the verticals, I said we have 16 verticals, so there are 16 people who I have to deal with, or they have to deal with me. Um, those 16 think that their verticals, their brands, are important, and they are to the people who, work, who live and work in the brands. You know, when you get up in the morning and you work at Ogilvy, the prime driver should be Ogilvy, but there should be benefits of uh, membership, the benefits of membership being part of a group. But our clients don't. Our clients want the best people working on their business. No longer 
are they primarily interested in the agency brands? You know, the, the days of Mad Men, Mad Men came to an end. I saw the final, the final hour actually this morning. I watched it this morning on a plane this morning. Um, life is no longer like that. Actually, there's some interesting sort of trailers in uh, Mad Men. In fact, we're doing a session with Matthew Wiener in, um, in uh, Cannes at our stream conference, which is our digital conference on the Tuesday afternoon. But um, there's a lot of interesting trailers as to what happened 20, 30, 40, 50 years after Don Draper and Roger Sterling. But those days have gone. So we'll come on to that. So there are 10 things, with that as a, a backdrop, there are 10 things that we see going on at the moment that we think you should be thinking about. Why I'm telling our competitors what they should be thinking about is that something that uh, escapes me, but that's what I, I mean, Michael's asked me to do. So, so the real 10 I've kept hidden, right? <laughs> this is, this is the, so the, the first thing is the easy one, which is everybody's aware. I mean, if there are any Americans, are there any Americans in the room? Yeah, okay. Americans quite rightly believe that, that New York is still the center of the world. It is. But life is changing. Life is changing. And it's changing, and it's moving to the east, the obvious one, China, India, but other markets like Indonesia and Vietnam, Myanmar, places like that. To the south, meaning Latin America. So I, you know, I've always thought that this is the decade of Latin America. It just shows how wrong I've been. I, I did a presentation with Luis Moreno of the Inter-American Development Bank in Cartagena, I remember, in Colombia a few years ago. Uh, it, was, it was around after Santos's first uh, election. We did his second election. And after he was elected, uh, for the first time, we thought, you know, Colombia was on the up. Luis is a Colombian, and we did a presentation about this being the decade of Latin America. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked out quite the way we think, but I would say we're still very bullish on Latin America and the events of the World Cup and the Olympics, which I think will be a stunning event next year. Stunning in a good sense, not in a bad sense. Um, repositions, not just Brazil, but repositions Latin America as a continent, just like we saw with the FIFA World Cup with South Africa, what we saw with the Beijing Olympics in the case of China and Asia. So to the south, and then the southeast, Africa and the Middle East, critically important. And it's interesting that most agencies ignore, not the Middle East, but they do ignore Africa. You know, we have a market share. I'm not encouraging all of you to go to Kenya now, but it's in incredible that through Scan Group, we have 80% of the East African market, which tells you something about how sleepy our industry is. There's very little, you know, the, the American agencies, be somewhat controversial, the American agencies are very parochial. Whilst I'm not a great fan of the French agencies, as you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to say that uh, both Publicis and Havas have a much more worldly view of the world than Omnicom or IPG or others. And the reason for it is quite simple, actually. It's, it's understandable. If you have 300 million people on your back, on your doorstep, your attitude to global expansion is very different than if you have 60 million or 66 million here at the moment. France is not much bigger. It's roughly the same size. So if you have a small domestic market and you want to be a big multinational, obviously you're going to go, you're going to go abroad. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that in most segments in which we operate in, demand is less than production, which is good news for everybody in this room because it means that differentiation is critically important. So differentiating products and services or corporate brands, either tangibly or intangibly, is critically important because production exceeds, supply exceeds demand. And in fact, if I take Ford as our largest client, the car and truck category, you would think post Lehman, which was September of 2008, and the contraction you would think that supply had contracted, but that is not the case. The position today is exactly the same as it was pre layman so, so the car and truck industry can produce 80 million units, consumers can consume 60 million units. The balance has changed. So the US was 17 million units pre layman It shrank to nine. It's back to 17. China is now 22 million units. Some people predict it'll go to 30 million units. But what's happened is, although the big three, you know, Ford was the only one that didn't take government money, Chrysler, 
and GM took government money, went into Chapter 11 effectively. They've contracted their supply, but the increase in supply has come from South Korea, Japan, China, India. So what, as you, it's like squeezing a balloon. It's been squeezed in the US, but it's expanded in the rest of the world. And the, but where there is the shortage, the paradox about all this is where's the shortage? The shortage is people. If you look at the uh, population statistics of all countries, even the young countries, like a Pakistan or a Mexico, at about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years' time, the, the birth rate starts to tail off. You know, women, thank God, are coming into the, work, the workplace more and more. There is more gender equality. Not enough, but more gender. And by the way, women are better at, in our industry than men. True. I knew I would get at least half the audience applauding me. <laughs> Um, but I've got to tell you one thing that's really interesting. Uh, one of the guys in our company, Joel Benenson, is, uh, is um, Hillary Clinton's pollster. It was Obama's pollster for the last two elections. Isn't it? The most amazing statistic, and I don't know the numbers, but it just floored me. They've been doing some polling of men and women in America. More, a greater proportion of men favor the idea of a female president than women, which I find staggering. But anyway, i just throw that out as a totally irrelevant fact, but I throw it out. But the demand for talent, if you think we've had a war for talent, because of the constriction in supply and because of the elongation of life, you know, the average, I think for a baby born today in Europe, life expectancy is now 100 years. Right? So when I was born, I think it was something like 60. So living longer, supply of people because the birth rate is going to fall, is going, you know, that's the biggest... Well, what's Japan's biggest problem? The fact is they're not adding to the population. Abe, I remember when he, went, when he tried to become prime minister for the first time, we had a session with him in Tokyo. Um, it was the IAA, I think, actually took us there. And we had a session with him, and he said his big economic policy was going to be to stimulate the birth rate. And we asked him how he was going to do it. Total silence. Never... <laughs> Never had an answer. Anyway, that's, that's a key issue. So if we're in the, the people business, we invest $12 billion a year in people. We invest in human capital. We invest $450 million a year in f things, in offices and fixtures and fittings. We invest so if 25 times more in people than we do in things. So human capital is our investment. And that, that struggle that finding the people, keeping them, incentivizing, motivating them is going to get even more and more difficult. Uh, the, the, th the third thing we see is disintermediation. I mean, this is just simply the web. You know, you've had a lot of, I'm sure, a lot of stuff today about the web. What do they do? What, you know, what, is La what are Larry and Sergey, what business are they really in? They're in the disruption or disintermediation business. They are out to kill off I mean, I was at a conference in uh, Seattle last week with Microsoft, the CEO's conference. The guy from Uber was there, and he said, within five years, he, and Mary Barra, who's the CEO of uh, GM, was in the audience. He said, within five years, we're going to make sure that nobody in America owns a car, which was sort of interesting. Okay? Um, so disintermediation, that's what Zuckerberg's at, Sheryl Sandberg, Dick Costello, or disintermediation of traditional business models, <coughs> disintermediating them with very different business models which are evaluated in different ways. So WPP is evaluated in organic growth, revenue growth, margins, profitability, cash flow, EBITDA. That is not the, those are not the criteria that are applied to web companies. Usually tends to be hits, likes, the revenue line, you know, Netflix is a phenomenon, but it's still unprofitable. Amazon is a phenomenon, but it's still unprofitable. And the metrics are quite extraordinary when you look at them. So they disintermediate you. They, if you're a legacy business, you, they disintermediate you with a different business model, and they steal your people because, coming looping back to the talent point, these small, technologically 
energetic companies are much more attractive destinations for kids coming out of school. Or even for mature people, more mature people. The fourth thing we see, and this is really important, is a big change taking place in retail. So for the last, uh, I, I think the previous speaker mentioned Tesco and the, the problems. It was. So retail was dominated by the big box retailers, by Walmart, by Tesco and Carrefour. And big box retailing, big sites outside city centers were critically important. And the retailer had control over the manufacturer. Dunhumby, as you know, is up for sale. It's a company that we're really interested in. But it's interesting that Dunhumby is not owned by a manufacturer or by a service business. It's owned by Tesco. And in fact, in, in, in America, where they've split it up, and Kroger has taken part of it, in France, Casino. In Brazil, it would be probably Casas Bahia and Ponta Frio. They're, they're, it's the retailers that control the data, which is quite remarkable. So the retailers had control. But the life is changing. And for two reasons. One is 50% of the world's population lives in cities. It will be 70%. This was the grounding for Ogilvy's campaign, famous campaign, Smarter Planet, Smarter Cities with IBM. So 70% of the world are going to live in cities. And the rise of e-commerce, which means for the first time, for many, many years, manufacturers are going to have a direct relationship with the consumer. Now, the big challenge to that... so so. That's the reason we've drawn the, the, the V differently. We think manufacturers and e-retailers can outdistance the traditional retailer. So what is Whole Foods doing last week? It's very interesting. You know, Whole Foods premium organic food, they're going to bring out smaller stores and cheaper. Smaller stores, proximus, proxim, proximity retailing, plus e-commerce. And that's the way to outgun the traditional retailer, except Alibaba and Amazon. Because what they are, they are the Walmarts and Carrefours and Tescos, potentially, of the future. And just to give you an idea, you know, Alibaba is probably around, it was the sixth most valuable company on the planet. I think it's back up to $220 billion of market cap. I think Amazon is now 180. I mean, and the statistics are, are riveting because Amazon has sales of about 70 billion, if my memory serves me right, and makes virtually no money. And Alibaba, so Alibaba's at 220 billion. Amazon is at 180, has, I think, 75 billion in sales. No money, no profit. Alibaba has 220 billion market cap, 8 billion of sales, and 4 billion of profit. Amazing. Absolutely extraordinary. But those are the two two at the moment, and then you've got Flipkart in India, which is progressing in a similar way. The next thing we see is the power of internal communication. So if you said to me, what's the biggest challenge that I have with that mess that I showed you at the beginning? Okay, What do I do with that mess? So I have all these brands, and we've grown by acquisition, because 30 years ago, almost to the day, we were a wire basket manufacturer. And I, you know, if I wanted to try and build a major multinational marketing services company, which is what we said we wanted to do, in my lifetime it had to be done by acquisition. The biggest challenge with this lot, particularly when you're going by acquisition, is communication. How do you communicate internally strategic and structural trait change? Now, I'm sure that everybody in this room, in the organizations in which they work, work seamlessly together. That when your colleagues ring you up and say, can you help me with this, you know, at mid midnight um, after a long, hard day, you instantly say, of course I will help you. Of course I will cooperate. Of course I will bury my, my ego, turf territory. But I've got to tell you, everybody outside this room is very different. And getting people to work together, and the only thing I would say about this is I, I, I never cease to be amazed by the ability of human beings to subvert org organizational purpose. <laughs> so much so that I've come to the conclusion that if I want to go left, I tell everybody to go right, because I know they're going to go left. And you laugh, but I'm deadly serious. Turf territory, and pr by the way, it's even more difficult, because the better the people are, the worse they are. The less cooperative, because the good people who've got a track record of, by and large, being right, 
and successful, so they think they know everything. And they'll never be told to work together. So, get, so communicating strategic and structural change is very important. This is really important. So we've been, I've been writing about this. You know, every year we, I do the poor man's Warren Buffett. I, I try and write this think piece about the industry. I've been doing it for 30 years. And um, nobody takes any notice of it. But on this one, actually, they've started to take notice. So we've been saying that organizations will become more centralized. They'll become more focused at the center. And Jeff Immelt explains this. He, at the Microsoft conference last year, he was very articulate on this. He said, I want to have a, an agile center, a more networked center at GE, more powerful, smaller, more technologically focused. I want to have local, more local influence. Like we operate in 111 countries. I think GE operates in 150, 160, 170. How can anybody in New York or anybody at WPP, the 350, 400 people at the center of WPP, know what goes on in each of the 111 countries? So we have client leaders. We have 46 of them who coordinate our business across our clients. Our, our top 46 clients are one third of our business, about $7 billion of revenue, about 40,000 people. So we have that, and then at the local level, we have country managers. They have no power, but they have the responsibility of making sure we have the best people, the best acquisitions, and that we work with the local clients. By the way, local clients are really important because the multinational clients think that their competition are the multinational clients. Not true. So Proctor's competition is not Unilever. Unilever's competition is not Proctor. It's the local companies. It's the local Indian detergent company, which has now grown to be the biggest detergent company in India. That's the real competitor to a Unilever and a Procter or a Colgate. It's not, the people at the center think it's the companies that the analysts look at. It isn't. Life is changing, particularly with the growth of those fast growth markets. So what we're seeing is a squeeze on regional. What Jeffrey Moult said, I want a more agile center. I want local knowledge. The regional people are counterproductive because they have the power to say no, not the power to say yes. They stop things coming down. They stop things going up. This is happening in a big way. We're seeing this with a lot of... Now, if we could take out our regional management, you can imagine this does not go down well at a regional manager's conference at WPP. But if we could take out that layer, our margins would improve or we would have about one and a half to two percent improvement in our margins. So every hundred basis points is two hundred million dollars. So we're talking about big money. So that's it. Now I, I don't have to say this. And are there any procurement people in the room? Good. Uh, <laughs> are there any finance people in the room? No finance or procurement. I think you must be masquerading. I think you must be. There must be. Anyway. The big problem, you know, if somebody said to me, what keeps me awake at night, it's this. It's not fast growth market. It's not digital. It's not talent. I mean, they do, but this is the thing that really worries me. Clients are totally focused on cost. The world is growing at about 5% nominal, 3% real, so inflation is about 2%. It's probably going to get less. I was at a board meeting this morning, and... One of our major clients was there, and he sees the world getting tougher. So I, I don't want to spread doom, doom and despondency, but I think it is things are tightening up. And ever since Lehman, you know, the world has grown subtrend. So we used to grow pre-Lehman faster, and by definition, it was too fast, so it blew up. So it has to grow slower. There's very little inflation. In fact, we're all worried about deflation, so no very little pricing power. So cost rules. And people are totally focused on cost. To win, to get to their numbers. You know, if you look at Q1, the reported results of public companies, a lot of them have missed on the top line. They've made the bottom line, but by cutting cost. So the rise of procurement, marketing has lost power. If there's one thing that the IAA could do that really would be of use, it would be to get clients to focus on the top line and not the costs. That's the game. And then, by the way, you have, so if you think about a spectrum so you're of, of competition, at one end you have 3G and Anheuser-Busch and 
and uh, Heinz and Kraft and Burger King and Tim Hortons. And goodness knows what's next, by the way. At the other end, you have Uber and Airbnb. And in the middle, you have Nelson Peltz and Bill Aikman and Dan Loeb pushing down on you. And the average life of a CEO in a packaged goods company, or in any, any company, is about five to six years. The average life of a CFO is about three to four years. The average life of a CMO is two to three years. Here in the UK, I had a figure from some of the news media who said it was 26 months. You know, it's like being in a political office. You, you, you have five to six years to run. You're not going to do anything that really disturbs the status quo. So you're much more likely to sit on cost than you are to grow the revenues. This is the biggest issue. And nobody likes to talk about it, really, because it's confrontational. But it is the issue. This is, the, the, I think, the real problem with it. Now, government got involved after Lehman because to bail everybody out. You know, I mentioned uh, the government lending money or recapitalizing Chrysler and GM. Well, they did it with the banks here as well. Government became involved. And if you look at the precedent for this in the 1930s after the Great Depression, government never got out of the way until World War II. I'm not suggesting we have World War III, but I'm just saying that government is here to stay. In most countries in which we operate in, our biggest client is government. Despite government cutting costs, trying to get deficit spending under control, governments as communicators are actually extremely important. The last, the last but one issue is sustainability. I mean, I don't, we over-intellectualize this. I mean, we go to conferences and have venerable speakers going droning on and on and on. It's very simple. It's one sentence. John Brown, who used to be the CEO of BP, said in 1997 at Stanford Business, Business School, if you are in business for the long term, doing good is good business. Finish. That's it. We know that consumers like companies and prefer companies that appeal to all stakeholders. We know that people who are employees, prospective employees, students, prefer companies that take into account the sustainability issues. Consumers may not be willing to pay for what's necessary yet, but sustainability is at the core. So every client we work with, there used to be a lot of greenwashing. It's no longer. But for goodness sake, don't over-intellectualize this stuff. It's just simple. Doing good is good business. If you're in business for the long term, if you're in business for the short term, you'll, you'll do anything to, to make money. And the last point is consolidation. So my view is clients will continue. In this world, which is slow growth, where there's little inflation or pricing power. And by the way, I see no, little or no reason why this should change in the short to medium term. I see no upside breakout from 5% growth. So, so if you think it's, I think the world is quite difficult. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. You know, you have to kick and claw your way through it. That is not going to stop. I think we have to get used to this, and it means more consolidation. It means, you know, in a way, I'm, a, I'm at odds with the previous speaker. You know, he talked about humanity and technology. I disagree. The biggest problem we face, actually, is that technology may reduce the demand for people. It is not proven that the web actually creates more employment than it destroys. And if you think about 3D and, and robotics, I'm on the board of Alcoa. I've seen at close hand what happens in manufacturing processes when you start to see 3D printing and robotics. And, it, and just think about what the guy from Uber said. In five years, he doesn't want anybody to own a car. Now, if you rent or share a car, somebody's going to have to produce that car, but there's going to be fewer people producing these things. And we haven't sort of figured that one out. When I came out of university in the late 60s, 1960s, the premium on economic policy was full, full employment. Full employment. Beverage, post-World War II. What was the level of inflation we were prepared to tolerate at full employment. It was the Phillips curve, a famous professor at the London School of Economics. Today, it's what's, you know, the level of what's, what's the level of unemployment we're prepared to suffer at zero inflation, although we're a bit worried about that now. So 
in this world, clients are going to continue to consolidate. Watch, what's Warren going to do next with the Brazilians? When, when, when Heinz announced Kraft, all our package goods clients, and we work with everyone virtually, said, who's next? It's really interesting to see what happens. Secondly, you're going to see the media owners. You know, we've seen Comcast fail. We've seen Rupert Murdoch try with Time Warner. We've seen AT&T succeed, we think, with DirecTV. There's going to be more of it. You saw Verizon do... Verizon really turned the rules upside down last week by announcing a deal with AOL. So Verizon, in a way, becomes a frenemy. They're a client of ours, but they become a frenemy because they're in the ad tech business, and we're in the ad tech business. And then last but not least, the agency business will consolidate. You know, POG may have failed. I mean, logically, POG should have gone through. You know, if Maurice and John couldn't have figured it out, and we're arguing about their financial officer, and if the deal made sense from a share owner point of view, they should have gone and replaced it with a couple of people who could get on with one another. Because if it was good for the shareholders, it should have happened. In fact, how the two of them managed to survive, I don't know. That was like greeted with silence. <laughs> but I'm serious. Absolutely serious. In the year 2000, two, I can't remember the names of the companies, but two telecommunication companies tried to get together. They spent on a merger of equals. It was exactly a parallel case. They spent 12 months trying to figure it out, and after 12 months, they couldn't figure it out. And the Wall Street, and they, said, they announced, the two CEOs said, because we couldn't agree the social terms, i.e. who was going to do what to whom, we're calling it off. And the Wall Street Journal wrote, if this is to the benefit of shareholders, it should be done. It shouldn't be stopped by two people being unable to get on with one another. But you're going to see more consolidation in the agencies. And I just leave you, I'll come on to just two things I want to leave you with, and we'll, when I'll finish and open it up. What's really interesting, nobody says this, you have already a very different model, which nobody taught, well, two, actually two different models. Dentsu was owned by the media in Japan. It was owned by the newspaper groups. It IPO'd, and the newspaper groups reduced their shareholding, but the media still owns a piece of Dentsu. Havas in France is owned by Bolloré Investissement, which owns 61% of Havas. What else does Bolloré own? Event, well, he owns 15% of Vivendi. And there's a nice, neat little thing, wrinkle in French shareholder law now, which is if you hold the stock for two years, you get double the voting rights. So depending on who else has shares, he could go from 15 to 30. But he owns an agency and a media company. He owns a television station. I think there's some newspaper interests in there too and a music company. So you've already got, whether that model would work outside France or not is another question. Because French models are unique. Could be uniquely good, by the way. Um, but it's really interesting. So, so the consolidation thing. Now, I'll just leave you with two things. This is just a summary of the 10 points. So this, this um, People who are legacy media owners get upset when I put this up. This is Mary Meeker's data. She's now a partner in Kleiner Perkins. She was a very famous analyst at Morgan Stanley just before the internet bust of 2001 too. But what she, what she does, and she, she's coming out with the latest data. This is, you can't see 2013 because it's buried beneath that 30 billion opportunity in the US. But, but this is 2013, consumer data in the US. The yellow blocks is, is time spent, and the mauve blocks are the investment, not by WPP, but the industry. So there are a couple of inter interesting things there. Radio, and radio is about OK, is equal. But print, this is traditional print. This is felling trees, distributing newsprint. 5% time spent, 19% of investment. Switch to the other two columns on the right-hand side. I'll come back to TV in a second. Internet and mobile, you add them up. 45% time spent, only 26% investment. Money has to migrate from the left to the right. What's very interesting is the TV 
columns for the first time have diverged. And you've got 38% time spent, 45% investment. Now, we, we bought 15, 20% of Rentrack and 20% of Comscore. Outside the US, we measure audiences. So we're the non-US Nielsen we, in 45 countries. But in America, because most of the media owners think Nielsen is deficient, which they are, in measuring audiences, they don't measure out of home. They don't measure beyond C plus three, which is point of insertion plus three days. Group M, our media buying operation, planning operation, says C plus seven. With strict standards on viewability on video, by the way, as well, which is the, the flip side of it. But what this is showing is that there's some changes taking place in consumption of linear television, because over the top television is in the internet and mobile blocks. It's not in the, the middle block is showing that something is happening in terms of TV viewing which is changing. And this is true of, of, of non-mature markets. If you went to China or Italy or Brazil or India, you'd find the same. And it's even worse there, or quicker, not worse, quicker, because they didn't go through the PC phase. The reason it's slower in the US and the UK is we went from Legacy to PC to mobile, to smartphone. China's gone straight to smartphone. So that's one thing. But because you know, legacy media gets very upset when they see this, there is this debate about media engagement. There's a lot of the traditional media owners that say engaging with the media, traditional media, is much more effective. And I just want to just throw, throw this in just to show you that this is from newspapers in Canada. Obviously, vested interest speaking, but it's interesting because it shows that newspaper engagement by consumers, you know, the average person here in the UK reading the Times reads it for 40 minutes. And that traditional media, you know, our newspapers did no, because engagement, you know, we, we have a deal with Twitter in every one of those 45 markets where we measure TV, where Twitter is active, we will have data on consumer engagement with live television. And my favorite story is that we've got data that shows that two people sitting on a couch watching a live television program are more likely to tweet one another than they are to talk to one another. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely true. Absolutely true. So, so, so don't, and then this is, this is some, some other d uh, Newsworks data, which clearly shows that newspapers, in terms of engagement, are extremely powerful. So, you know, the die is not cast for legacy media, even for traditional newspapers. So, why don't I just go back to those 10? Um, I don't know how much more time we've got, Michael.